Thank you everybody for joining us today in the Art of Estate Planning. I am delighted to let you know that I have a special guest, John Kasher from the Australian Financial Wealth Group, joining me today to talk about his journey with offering estate planning to his clients. Welcome, John. Thanks, Tara. I appreciate it. I wanted to have you on as a guest because I really love the way that you approach estate planning in your business and for your clients. And I thought it would just be um, inspirational perhaps for some of the financial advisors who are looking at doing more with estate planning for their clients or even um, people who are still doing a fair bit with estate planning. I think it's really helpful just to sort of hear what others are doing because mm -hmm. It is a bit of a new frontier for financial advisors taking the lead in estate planning. So the more we can talk about it and share ideas, the better. So yeah. I'd love um, to, for you to share your journey today. Before we jump into that, I just want to check, are you happy for people to ask you questions as we go? Yeah, go for it. They can ask, they can ask me anything they like. Okay. Well, so John, Tell us a bit about yourself. Tell us about your business, how you got into financial planning. Let's hear your story. So mine um, is probably not your most common one. So uh, my cousin owned a, a pretty decent risk uh, based business based in Melbourne. And um, I was 14 and nine months and coming from a, a, a working based background. It was 14, nine months, go get a, go get a, uh, some work experience, go get a job. So I, oh, called my cousin who I was quite close with at the time and you know I said listen can you go get me a job and I thought it was pretty cool you know financial planner you know I just learn about things and coming into you know we're talking about 2002 2003 getting into a financial planning practice in risk-based business you know and seeing as a 14 year old the amount of dollars even on applications that we were talking about here we're talking about you know life insurance and the millions you know this that it was just you know, for me, it was like, wow, oh my gosh, there's this totally different world. You know, for a 14 year old, it was like seeing 50 bucks was, was big. Whereas, you know, seeing these large numbers was, so it was pretty, it was pretty you know, big for me, but I started to just really like what I did. I, I saw the impacts that we can make, you know, I, I saw claims getting paid and um, yeah, I, I felt really, really, um, you know, I, I felt that I was making a, 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 an impact and I think that became my obsession. And I think that from there, you know, we're talking, you know, from 14, I think I was about, I was 18 or 19 when I got my financial planning license. So kind of st stuck in the role, you know, after school, going and doing work every holiday, wow. you know, summer holidays, kind of doing it all. I think I wrapped up my dip uh, FP, you know, in the meantime. And so I was, as you can see, just, Pretty much a workaholic when it kind of come because but i loved it because i was just making such an impact but as i developed i started becoming also probably um really client centric and really like client obsessed and i, I know this is kind of a common thing with you know probably good business practices as they just you know become obsessed with the client and so if coming from a risk perspective it was really like when these checks were getting paid and these events were happening you know, it was usually a document like a will or a binding nom that it would kind of go to, yeah? And it was just that. That's 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 where the relationship ended. And they may, if it was, you know, if it was, if it was life insurance, they may come on, you might do superannuation advice or whatever it may be. But it was, I, I thought there was, a, there was more to this, yeah? And so um, as years went by, I tried to just understand the impact that we can make. And so... What I started to do was, especially in the estate planning side of things, is start to understand what what are we actually doing in estate planning, which was the easiest thing. Yeah, it's not a will, it's not a binding nom, it's not power of attorneys. It's much more than that. You know, we're talking about the transition of wealth from one family to the next. We're talking about controls. We're talking about you know a lot of peace of mind that we can give individuals. So. Um, you know, I think that I just started to learn a little bit more and actually the more I learned about it, I'm not, I, I understood that planning shouldn't be the last thing that a financial planner does. It should actually be the first one. And right. we're obsessed with financial yeah, because we're obsessed with financial planners about like when it comes to investments. Like think about when we talk about superannuation or retirement, it's like, 
let's reverse engineer it, Mr. and Mrs. Client. Yeah, how much do you need at retirement? How much do you need to live on? We're not talking about next year stuff. We're talking about the stuff when they need the money. So ultimately, what are we talking about when we're talking about building wealth? We're talking about improving their financial situation for not just them, but for their kids, their grandkids, this, that, and the other. And I, I think that this also coincides with what's going on in Australia as well, too, where there's this massive intergenerational wealth, you know, that's going on at the moment. We've got the baby boomers that are, are, are gonna start passing on wealth. So, you know, it was really for me both a business opportunity that I was looking at, but also about just this makes sense to me. And I think that what I had problems with more importantly, Tara, was I think licensees weren't geared for where I was kind of going. So I was always pushing the envelope. And what I mean by this is that when we talk about looking at estate planning as the first goal, let's talk about something that's really basic. Like you look at a client profile or a fact find for a client and they've got $100,000 in their own money and they've got superannuation. Now, in my, I would say my licensee or basic training, it would have been super or non-super and we would have stayed there. Yeah. But it's much more than that. It's like, what's the 100,000 for? What are we doing every year? What's it all for? Is this for the kids? So I had, a, I had, I had an example just recently and this is how far we've got it. So both on high incomes, very, very decent superannuation amount. They've got surplus spending. They're like your perfect financial advisory client. Yeah? Yeah. And I said, you can retire now. You can stop. Like, you don't need to work anymore. What's this all for? Always comes up. We've got a daughter. She's 16. We want to make sure she's set up well. What do you want to do? I want to buy her a house. I want to do this. I want to do this. Is she in a relationship? These are the questions I ask. Is she in a relationship? She's 16, yeah? No. Is she going to get one? one? Yeah, most likely. Uh, do you know the probabilities of that probably breaking down? Yes. And they better not get my money is the next yeah. one, yeah? And so we actually started there. And then out of that, we developed things. So for this client particularly, uh, there was two folds that we were looking at. We were looking at asset protection and we were looking at tax minimization. So we essentially got the lawyer and the accountant and me as the facilitator. And this is the importance of the role, yeah? Is I, I figured this out because yes, on a statement of advice that it was ending up being recommend the will, power of attorney and testamentary trust, but it's much more than that. I added in another strategy for this client, which was just simply, let's get your accountant and your lawyer in the room and discuss yep. how we should structure this correctly from both Love a legal it. protection perspective and, and a tax minimization perspective, and I will facilitate it. So they end up through the accountant and the lawyer and us, we kind of worked out that a family trust or a discretionary trust is best to hold these assets as they are today. They've got a testamentary trust for obviously their assets that they've accumulated now in their personal names so that the money will flow into the testamentary trust for their daughter, but the money will accumulate in a family trust from this point outside of super because they're maxing their caps. Yeah, we're talking about people that are, this is another avenue where they've got to put their money. And they also, technically, they want to stay in control of this, but give their daughter the benefits of that trust. Yep. So, as you know, um, as the daughter being a beneficiary, she has no legal entitlement to that money. Yeah. Um, so they've got their control. So they've got a lot of, and, and when this went all played through, and so when it gets to the end result, the clients... They weren't high-fiving me about the investment that we put them in. They weren't high-fiving me about what we did with their superannuation. They weren't high-fiving me about the insurance policies. Boring. That, was their that was boring in their expectation. They yeah. loved that I got their accountant in the room. They loved that I got their lawyer in the room and I facilitated that. And I want to take this one step further. After being with an accountant for so long, they ended up getting rid of their accountant because they re realised that their accountant wasn't up for the job. Now, I know this is shocking, but they're very loyal people and I commonly see this, yeah? But we're talking about, so they just were used to it. But I kind of say this, it's imagine being with a personal trainer and you're never getting a six pack. That, that's what your goal was. Your goal was to get a six pack. You listened to the personal trainer, you did whatever you do and you never got a six pack. Well, when you do, when you connect all the dots up, they ended up realizing that the personal trainer wasn't necessarily the best. Um, and they went and saw another one who they were absolutely happy with. And why I'm raising this is that clients are also getting smarter. 
Yeah. The reason why our industry was held up with all of this regulation problems and whatnot was that, and I mean this, the industry forgot about the client. Yeah. What does the client want? I mean, I would say the same of the legal industry to a degree. We've got yeah. the same problem with our insurers. We forgot the client. What does the client want? The client ultimately wants. If I reverse engineered this now and I sat the clients down, I said, now you've gone through the whole process, what do you actually want? And what do you feel good about? We feel good that we've, we've got a plan to make sure that our daughter's taken care of. Like that would probably be their number one thing. And we have a plan in place to protect our assets, not just for her, but you know, she has kids that for their kids and whatnot. So my connection now with that family is now beyond my direct client. It's now the daughter and that's just one client and that's an involvement. You know, I've got many clients now that we work with where we've got an intergenerational connection um, in their lives to the point where clients are saying, listen, we've, you know, we want to change our, I don't know, backup um, executor or, or they're putting me in roles um, now to yeah. make sure that because they, they go and they, 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 they say to me, John, who, who understands what we really want? Who has an independent view that sits outside of our family? As you know, as a lawyer, you know, most of the issues happen when families are involved and they want that person to sit in an independent state, um, but understand what the clients actually want, even when they're not around. So as soon as we started doing that, Cara, um, the game changed. Um, and, and I mean that because clients no longer saw us as a, um, you know, that, I like hate a to use the word. provider. Yeah, it wasn't a service provider anymore. I was a part of the, I'm part of the family. Like, you know, and I'm happy with sharing. I've got two lovely boys who I'm a proud father for. Um, and, you know, when the kids got born, it was like inundated with gifts for them. Yeah, like, and I, I'm not talking that as in to blow my trumpet or whatever. It was... Meaning, like the cards that were yeah. written were, you know, you, like you were a part of the family. And I think for me, and talking about that journey of that 14 year old kid that started, um, you know, sometimes I feel so touched because I think that I've finally got that connection. Um, and it actually came from estate planning, it didn't come from cash flow or investments and things like that. It was actually understanding what the estate wants. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. I I mean, just that is such a beautiful story and you've just hit the nail on the head about why I'm so passionate about the role of the advisor in estate planning because it just does, it does, it rarely happens with an estate planning transaction between a lawyer and a client because it's just a one-off. Um, so what do those clients, the one you just mentioned as the case study, what did they come to see you for? Was it just investment advice or super advice? Like they walked in oh. or they booked the initial appointment. What, what motivated them? Oh, I, I actually love it and I'm laughing because I still remember the conversation. I nearly actually kicked the clients out of the meeting, to be honest with oh, you. Okay. Because they, yeah. <laughs> and I'm very, as you can tell, I'm very straightforward. But Essentially, you know, they were the typical clients, you know, I want to invest, you know, um, you know, I expect a return of this and da da da. Like they were actually very difficult clients. At the start. <laughs> and I said, listen, you know, sorry, you aren't for me, you know, and I pretty much, I remember opening the door. Yeah. And I'm still sitting there. So you can understand how, like, anyway, and she, the, 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 the wife was, she was a bit pushed back. She was like, oh, maybe we've taken this a bit too far. Like, you know, and, um, and I said, I, and she goes, you know, what do you actually do, John? And like, she kind of paused. So I went through my spiel, but she, she wanted to kind of hear it again. Yeah. And I, I said, I, I change people's lives. That's what I'm here to do. I'm not here to, you know, um, you know, promise you a return. I'm not here to do this. I'm not here to do that. I'm, I, I do what I do because we get results. Um, from following a plan. So I need to ask you again, don't tell me about what investments and da, da 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 what do you want? And usually what people say when they, what do you want? I want holidays, I want cars, and I have to go deeper, yeah? Let's let's be honest. If you're gonna do the job properly, you gotta get to the, the bedrock, yeah? They wanna obviously make sure that they're financially fine. 
but they got a, a daughter. Yeah, they got one daughter. That's all they've got, and she's their world. And yeah. when we talk about that, it was all about that. And so they came for investment advice, essentially. Um, but they didn't know what they want. They came in with a, I use the doctor analogy always. Yeah, it's like someone comes in with a chest pain. Yeah. They don't come to the doctor and say, all right, listen, I've got to have open heart surgery. Um, I need to do this, 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 and this, yeah? So they came in with chest pains. Yeah, all good. They had chest pains. But what we found out was it wasn't really the chest where the problem was. We just found out there was signals coming from the neck or whatever it was, yeah? And and still got the same result, still very happy getting results from what they need to do. But, yeah, they definitely did not walk in to uh, discuss estate planning. Let's put it that way. <laughs> And I can imagine approaching the estate planning discussion the way that you did. It was so much more powerful and effective than, okay, we've got your super and your life insurance and your investments sorted. Now you need to do a will. Yeah. It's not and then like that's that. it. If there's a one, you know, it's a, in the statement of advice at the end, the last section or whatever, you've got to get your will done as well. Like, it's just a completely different conversation by the sounds of it. Exactly. So when you're talking about a will, let's let's break this right down if we want to do this properly. For most people, a will is just a document. It's got a few names in it based on a template and it kind of sits in a drawer and never get done. But if we just phrase it a different way and say, listen, we've gone on this journey together. Yeah, we want this all to happen. As soon as you die, I don't have you to tell me the story to tell me what you want to happen. We need to make sure this story is documented. And then if you're not with us, or you're, sorry, if you're with us, but don't have the capacity to, we still need your story to continue. So I still need to work with your power of attorney. I still need to work with, so all an estate planning that from the, from the, from the will and from the power of attorneys and those documentation, that is the extension of our story together, yeah? Um, so yeah, wow. I, I, don't, I, I love don't, that. Yeah, I don't see it as a document because, um, and I think that's what changes things. If you look at a financial plan, for example, and I, I people used to get fixated, I, I still remember this. It's like, oh, we create great financial plans and clients pay for a financial plan. A financial plan is a legal document that we provide a client that stipulates the story that we've provided to them. Now that means nothing if it's not executed well, exactly the same as an estate plan, yeah? yeah? So all these documentation are, let's be honest, it's a lot of legal jargon, yeah? All of it is, yeah. is the stories that they want for their life. I love, I love that story analogy and the way that you explain it to them. I mean, I, I can imagine that it's an easy sell, right? Like you just, could close them every time based on that. Yeah. And we're also getting, and the thing is as well too, Tara, it's also, imagine them, so we get a lot of client referrals, okay? And we get obviously brothers and sisters and whatnot. And it's because when our clients become, they're now advocates, they're saying to their brother or their sister, he didn't ask me, what I thought he was going to ask me. He asked me questions that probably no one's ever asked me before in my life. And we documented that, we put them down, we've, we've got a plan and we're executing on that and we're, we're accountable for that. And I've also now got the peace of mind that even if I'm not around, that's still going to happen. And um, before COVID, COVID has been a bit tough because obviously in regards to seeing new clientele and I get it, yeah. But just so you can kind of understand what we're talking about here, um, I was booked out probably about two months in advance prior to COVID. And I'm wow. not saying that, like I said, to blow my trumpet. It was literally because the story is so powerful, because we care. And that my whole team is based on client first, caring about them while they're alive and even when they're dead. I love it. So in, in your um, case study that you talked us through just before, so not only did you do, by the sounds of it, a full service mm -hmm. advice solution for them in the end, but you locked yourself in as keeping those funds 
all that wealth under your management for the next mm-hmm. generation by, you know, really being the point of call for mm-hmm. the daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you sort of put yourself in as the linchpin or the trusted advisor with the accountants mm-hmm. and the new accountant and mm-hmm. the lawyer and the daughter and the family members. Mm-hmm. That's that's so powerful. Yeah, but- what, we, what we find, Tara, is that what, what clients t- typically do now, um, and it's amazing that they do this, so I'm not taking this lightly, is they'll grab the daughter, they will we'll be on a Zoom session these days, and they'll be like, sit on this meeting. And this daughter yeah. will be like 16. And it's not to understand what's going on, let's be honest, but it's like, this is John. Yeah. Um, something happens to us, John. Yeah? yeah. And, you know, we in your training, especially like when we did the Art of Estate Planning course and, and even in other studies that I've done, is that's the, that's the goal. That's the goal for us as advisors, that, you know, when they're reading out a will or whatever it happens is she knows. It's like a picture in my head, like yeah, imagine the will getting read out and there's like this business card of John that's like stapled on it, yeah? That's, that's what it is. And I think that a lot of people... Um, maybe miss that opportunity. I, I'm finding a lot of my friends that are in the in the game now are kind of, um, you know, doing it. I think there's a lot of good advisors that are doing it as well. And I think for the ones that don't do it or are maybe scared to do it, um, it's, it's not scary, yeah? It's the most fulfilling thing you'll do. Um, and I, I think... Tara, maybe, you know, through your education and your voice and I think now, you know, even my voice and a lot of other voices that we've got in the industry now, I think we're also making people aware of what they can do. And I now am thinking probably the biggest hurdle for me in regards to taking that leap from not doing it or doing it very basic, which was just do your binding noms and your wills and whatnot and leaving it there to actually executing it and having a plan in place and, and doing it the way we're doing it now, is I think the industry as a whole was very poor in educating advisors on what they can actually do. That's the gist of it. It's like they, we're very, very good at teaching people what they can do in the investment space or what they can do in the insurance space. But it was like, can an advisor actually tell a client to own something in a particular structure? And it was only until I was digging deeper that I actually said, oh yeah, I can do it. Like I went onto the TPB website, looked onto the tax practitioners board, you know, looked into Fazaya, looked into all of this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, there's like, I actually, if anything, I actually should be doing it, which goes on to my kind of next point. And I know we spoke about this offline and it's a topic that I've been speaking to a lot of advisors about now. Standard six of the Fazaya code for financial advisors states in there that we need to see the long-term impacts of our advice, essentially. So when we're talking about the long-term impacts, are we just talking about, and I haven't cleared this up, are we talking about the long-term impacts just on them? Are we talking about the long-term impacts that they could have on their estate? So if we're holding things, like let's say a basic situation, client wants to invest half a million dollars, yeah? And we as the advisor, let's just exclude super, let's say we've maxed that out for now, and we just assume to own the assets in either individual names or joint names. Let's just say we do that. And later on down the track, um, something happens, they don't like you, and they decide to come after you and say, um, submit a complaint that says the advisor didn't look into alternative ownership structures. They were aware of the kids that were there. Um, There was ability for them to set it up in a particular structure. They just never looked into it. I can see this easily happening. Um, And so we've actually implemented in our process that we make sure we speak to the accountant and the lawyer on any ownership structures. And clients get it. They understand the step. It's a bit of a delay in the process. But I think with the regu- what the regulator is trying to achieve from this, um, I think it's a really good one. I don't think we should just be assuming, oh, we want it in Jeff's name or we want it in Mary and Jeff's name. You know, is there alternatives? Is there other ways? Is there, and if you're not the expert, that's okay. Leverage on the experts. Like I don't come out here and say, oh, I'm, a, I'm an accountant. I know everything about tax. No, I say to the client, listen, let's have a chat with your accountant. Let's get jump on a Zoom call. Let's 
map this out, you know, da 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 Try to get the lawyer in at the same time, you know, if not, we'll kind of repeat the conversation, come in from both and act as that facilitator. And um, yeah, I think that one, like I said, that Fazaya and the law, I think wants us to do it. But I think as well too, we, we're, we've been poorly educated in actually what we can do. Um, yeah, from from a, from a from a industry perspective as well. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you've hit the nail on the head. I think with the phrase facilitator, mm -hmm. to me, it that's such a powerful role for a client to have a facilitator who understands the advice that may need to be brought into a situation. It doesn't mean you have to be giving it. You just mm -hmm. need to identify it and then bring in the special purpose advisors. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the Fasaya thing, which is, you know, that's only been around for a couple yeah, of years. Yeah, start of the year. Yeah, start of the year. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, start of the year. You know, uh, to me, it's like, what's the point of getting the life insurance and super and investments sorted if they don't end up in the right hands? down the track and i mean yes you've got the legal obligations under for sale but also just you know going to the core of why are you even bothering like if it's about achieving these goals and and wealth accumulation for a bigger purpose like a, leaving a legacy mm -hmm. why bother if we don't make it end up in the right hands at the end of the day correct and and I think that, like this whole code that we're talking about, um, it's a code of ethics, yeah? It's not a step-by-step -step guide in regards to the way that you should give advice. This is, a, this, is, this is people kind of coming together and saying, this is where we want the standard to be. And the standard looks at the long-term impacts of advice. And long-term impacts of advice goes hand in hand with estate planning. And, and so, you know, moving forward, Tara, we've become, you know, and my team has become even more obsessed with estate planning and how we can utilize it and how we can really structure it. And, and um, you know, I think that, you know, we're putting ourselves together with, um, you know, uh, as many good accountants and lawyers as we can um, because clients need to have good advice good advisors and that's the gist of it you know there's an old there's a saying you know my dad used to tell me when i was young he's like john if you want to do any good in business you've got to have a good accountant and a good lawyer yeah that was his that was his that was his thing and i'll go back to him now and i think i've added to the one and a good financial advisor as well but the the, the three um working together can do wonders in regards to a client situation and and, and you know while they're living and, and even you know beyond them um, you know, their kids, their grandkids and whatnot. And, you know, like I said, I'm a, I'm a proud father and I look at myself and I usually only do what I do for myself. And, you know, what am I doing it for? And I kind of ask myself the same question. And, um, you know, do I want my things structured correctly? Yes, I do. Do I want to take, um, do I want to make sure that I've got good asset protection? Yes, I do. Do I want to make sure, you know, what I want to happen actually happens? Yeah, with the highest amount of certainty, I want that to happen. And I guess... You know, in everything, there's this uncertainties. You know, family laws can kind of, you know, cut through a lot of this stuff. But, you know, we try and create the best probability and, and, and work as a facilitator because the financial advisor, I think, plays a pivotal role in that facilitation because um, we not only understand their financials, I think we understand their personal and um, their personal goals and their, 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 I think they tell us a lot more than they might tell the lawyer or what they might yeah. tell the accountant. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think we have a really, really important role as a facilitator um, with some really good accountants and lawyers. I mean, this isn't about you giving legal advice. Like it's not, there's no, at no point in the process are you trying to remove the legal piece from the process or give advice that you shouldn't have but people just aren't getting their estate planning done otherwise and having 
you know, they're already sitting down and talking to you about their planning and their goals and ultimately their legacy, even if they don't think that's what they're doing when they're working with a financial advisor. You guys are the experts at having those types of conversations. And tying, bringing in the estate plan as part of that, to me, it's just a no-brainer. I really believe that this is the future for estate planning. And, and, and I've known good advisors who have become great advisors by nailing this. And, you know, this is where the boutique advisor, I think, goes into that kind of family office scenario, you know, because um, they get this right. They might not yeah. they might not even know that they're doing it right, but it's, it's, it's that from the client's perspective. It's like this guy or lady or whatever understands the family, yeah, yeah. understands the... And, and and that's what we're trying to achieve and we're still learning every day um you know there's there's constant things that we're doing but i think that you know we've seen a very very big improvement um in our relationships with our clients um which as as i've probably repeated over and over again we're obsessed with um but you know as well too they have become advocates and you know um not asking for it like you know i think when we first started out in business it was like do you know anyone do you know anyone do you know anyone now it's not it's like you know john can you help x y yeah. and z you know um and 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 i hope for all of my advisors because i know that they're really good and you know accountants and lawyers as professionals um i think it's just understanding the client's needs much much better going in a deeper conversation and for advisors estate planning is just i think that next step so would I be right in saying, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but compared to sort of the more traditional way that you would approach estate planning, you know, adding it on at the end of the process, mm -hmm. passing comment or a sentence in the statement of advice to how you're doing it now, were mm -hmm. you leaving money on the table back then? Yeah, a lot, a lot. Um, yeah. Well, think about the process. So if you think about it, when I'm sitting with a client, even if it's writing it down or visually or whatever, I'm mapping out the family tree first. So I'm like, okay, before I get to, like, I want to get to know you, which is what we do really well. Fact finds, da, 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 da. I'll get that. Like, usually actually I get all their financial information for, like before they even see me these days. Yeah. And so in the first session, it's just like, all right, let me just, Get this for a second. All right, we've got Jeff, we've got Mary, we've got da da da, da. Like, I'm, I'm, in my mind, as soon as I see them, I'm estate planning. And I'm like, hmm, 16-year-old, yeah. not in a relationship, or two kids, you know, relationship, da 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 I'll go to the point where I'm like, listen, I don't mean to be forthcoming, but, like, how's the relationship here? And the answer you'll hear is not necessarily what you think you're going to hear, but you need to know it, yeah? Oh, actually, you know... <laughs> Mark and Belinda aren't well at the moment, you know. Um, yeah. You know, Rachel's doing okay. You know, we're pretty secure on that, but it is a bit of a concern to us. You know, we don't really, wow, you know, just by asking a question in regards to just, and I, I always obviously come up front and I'm like, listen, I don't ask you anything just because I want to know. Yeah, it's, it's, it, well, I'm asking for a reason. And when I kind of map out all that, so I'm starting with kind of estate planning first, um, really, because I'm trying to understand the family mapping then we get into goals and aspirations and it goes without saying do you want these goals and aspirations to continue beyond you yeah <laughs> obviously <laughs> oh, they're never gonna say no yeah i do not want that for my kids no i want all my money to be exhausted no they don't want that they usually yeah. either want the yeah so oh, that's, i that's love it that's really i love it so um i mean I knew, I knew we would have the same philosophy because you've done the Art of Estate Planning course and that's the same, but, you know, you've just articulated the power of estate planning so, so well. Um, so is there anything else that you wanted to add? I feel like you've sort of covered a lot of bases there, um, but before oh, we sort of wrap it up. Oh, I think it's just for anyone, like, you know, I'm a pretty approachable guy um and i know it's sometimes a bit daunting going into an area that you may not fully feel confident in going into 
um, reach out, you know, obviously, you know, Tara, you've been a great even resource for myself, but you know, everyone like who's in the group, you know, just hit me up. If you're, if you're a lawyer or you're an accountant or you're a financial advisor, um, you know, contact me. Um, if you're, if you're an accountant that wants to, you know, work with a financial advisor that does this, you know, I'm happy to do it. And if there's someone in your local area, you know, I've been in the industry long enough, I could even point you in that direction. I think that, you know, working together for the end goal for us, which is making our clients happy, um, you know, I'm, I'm a resource for that. And hopefully we, we change the industry to keep, or we'll continue to change the industry to keep focusing in this area. But, you know, my comments are, um, don't think about estate planning as the, the last thing to do. Think about estate planning as the first thing to do. Um, because even though a client won't come in there and say, I want to do this, they don't wake up in the morning usually and go, oh, I need to get my estate planning done. Um, you know, build that a part of the journey, build that a part of the story, and, and you will see wonders.